Welcome to Daedalus U. I'm Paul, coming to you from Brooklyn. Today we're going to do a close reading of the poem Home Burial by Robert Frost. First, we'll read the poem in its entirety. Just to give you a brief sketch or idea of what to expect, this masterpiece of a poem depicts a husband and wife grieving over the loss of their son and uh, failing utterly to communicate or console one another. This is an early poem of Frost's. It was published in a collection called North of Boston in 1914 and it is essentially a dramatic scene, a short scene made up mostly of dialogue and it all takes place on the stairwell of a country house. So if you'd like to skip to the close reading, you might want to jump ahead now about seven or eight minutes in the video. But first we'll read the poem in its entirety, Home Burial by Robert Frost. He saw her from the bottom of the stairs before she saw him. She was starting down, looking back over her shoulder at some fear. She took a doubtful step and then undid it to raise herself and look again. He spoke, advancing toward her. What is it you see from up there always, for I want to know? She turned and sank upon her skirts at that, and her face changed from terrified to dull. He said to gain time, what is it you see? Mounting until she cowered under him. I will find out now, you must tell me, dear. She, in her place, refused him any help, with the least stiffening of her neck and silence. She let him look, sure that he wouldn't see blind creature. And a while he didn't see, but at last he murmured, Oh, and again, oh, what is it, what, she said, just that I see. You don't, she challenged, tell me what it is. The wonder is I didn't see at once. I never noticed it from here before. I must be wanted to it. That's the reason. The little graveyard where my people are. So small the window frames the whole of it. Not much larger than a bedroom, is it? There are three stones of slate and one of marble, broad-shouldered little slabs there in the sunlight on the side hill. We haven't to mind those. But I understand. It is not the stones, but the child's mound. Don't, 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 she cried. She withdrew, shrinking from beneath his arm that rested on the banister, and slid downstairs, and turned on him with such a daunting look. He said twice over, before he knew himself, Can a man speak of his own child he's lost? Not you! Oh, where's my hat? Oh, I don't need it. I must get out of here. I must get air. I don't know rightly whether any man can. Amy, don't go to someone else this time. Listen to me. I won't come down the stairs. He sat and fixed his chin between his fists. There's something I should like to ask you, dear. You don't know how to ask it. Help me, then. Her fingers moved the latch for all reply. My words are nearly always an offense. I don't know how to speak of anything so as to please you. But I might be taught, I should suppose. I can't say I see how. A man must partly give up being a man with women folk. We could have some arrangement by which I'd bind myself to keep hands off anything special you're a mind to name. Though I don't like such things twixt those that love. Two that don't love can't live together without them. But two that do can't live together with them. She moved the latch a little. Don't, 
don't go. Don't carry it to someone else this time. Tell me about it if it's something human. Let me into your grief. I'm not so much unlike other folks as your standing there apart would make me out. Give me my chance. I do think, though, you overdo it a little. What was it brought you up to think it the thing to take your mother loss of a first child so inconsolably in the face of love? You'd think his memory might be satisfied. There you go sneering now. I'm not. I'm not. You make me angry. I'll come down to you. God, what a woman. And it's come to this. A man can't speak of his own child that's dead. You can't, because you don't know how to speak. If you had any feelings, you that dug with your own hand, how could you, his little grave? I saw you from that very window there, making the gravel leap and leap in air, leap up like that, like that, and land so lightly and roll back down the mound beside the hole. I thought, who is that man? I didn't know you. And I crept down the stairs and up the stairs to look again, and still your spade kept lifting. Then you came in. I heard your rumbling voice out in the kitchen, and I don't know why, but I went near to see with my own eyes. You could sit there with the stains on your shoes of the fresh earth from your own baby's grave and talk about your everyday concerns. You had stood the spade up against the wall outside there in the entry, for I saw it. I shall laugh the worst laugh I ever laughed. I'm cursed. God, if I don't believe I'm cursed. I can repeat the very words you were saying. Three foggy mornings and one rainy day will rot the best birch fence a man can build. Think of it. Talk like that at such a time. What had how long it takes a birch to rot to do with what was in the darkened parlor? You couldn't care. The nearest friends can go with anyone to death. Come so far short, they might as well not try to go at all. No, from the time when one is sick to death, one is alone, and he dies more alone. Friends make pretense of following to the grave, but before one is in it, their minds are tuned, turned and making the best of their way back to life and living people and things they understand. But the world's evil. I won't have grief, so if I can change it, oh, I won't, I won't. There. You have said it all, and you feel better. You won't go now. You're crying. Close the door. The heart's gone out of it. Why keep it up? Amy, there's someone coming down the road. You. Oh, you think the talk is all. I must go. Somewhere out of this house. How can I make you? If you do. She was opening the door wider. Where do you mean to go? First tell me that. I'll follow and bring you back by force. I will. A beautiful and sad poem about husband and wife trying desperately to communicate, but failing to do so as they grieve uh, or not grieve, frankly. Uh, in such different ways. So, today I thought we would simply read through the poem a second time, uh, pausing line by line uh, to interpret and to perform what's called a close reading of the poem and see if we can't get at the deeper meaning in the lines. But just before we do so, I I want to note how, yes, this is a deeply sad poem. And of course, Robert Frost 
suffered much in his own life. In fact, four of his six children died before he did, as did his wife. And he, uh, as well as his mother, suffered from depression throughout life. So if ever there were a poet to write eloquently and wisely about sadness and grieving, it was Robert Frost. But I want to pay particular attention today to the way in which Frost depicts both husband and wife in at once sympathetic and entirely unsympathetic lights. Um, as we look more closely at what happens here in this little scene on the stairwell, we see how communication between these two is is impossible. We see how each has self-isolated him or herself through a subtle psychological mechanisms of defense and alienation. So let's take a closer look. Let's turn back to the opening line of the poem, Home Burial, which reads, He saw her from the bottom of the stairs before she saw him. That is a poem in and of itself. That could be a minimalist two-line masterpiece. There is such a sense of drama and of tension. The scene is set. We are on a staircase. As you notice, the entire poem takes place on this stairwell. And there is a sense of one of the characters seeing the other without the other character seeing the first back in any equal and reciprocal way. And that's set up here with these first lines. He goes on, She was starting down, looking back over her shoulder at some fear. Of course, she's looking back at that window through which she has repeatedly gazed out upon the little graveyard in the backyard. And this repeated action of hers has become a kind of nightmare. The next line, she took a doubtful step and then undid it. You hear the lilt of the meter uh, the five feet, she took a doubtful step and then undid it. And that rather surprising word, undid it, uh, and the way it has that alliterative effect with doubtful, actually evokes her foot moving down the staircase and then sort of coming back to raise herself and look again. Then the poem goes on. He spoke advancing toward her. Now, we want to pay close attention to the movement in this poem. He is advancing towards her. There's an aggression in the word. And he says, What is it you see from up there always? For I want to know. He wants to be let into her inner life into her thoughts and mind and emotion. Notice the word always tells us again that she's been gazing out this window upon the grave many times. And notice also the demanding uh, nature of his request, for I want to know. Often, when the man speaks, the, the woman replies with action, with movement or gesture as she does so here. She turned and sank upon her skirts at that, and her face changed from terrified to dull. He said to gain time, what is it you see? Now, 
there is action on the staircase, mounting until she cowered under him. I want you to hear the menace in those words. Look at the diction, the verb choices here. Mounting until she cowered under him. There's a kind of sexual energy expressing itself as aggression and fear already in these opening lines that will play itself out throughout the rest of the poem. I will find out now, you must tell me, dear. So again, the blend in that line of his intensity, his demanding nature, and then the diminutive dear at the end to try to sort of soften his tone. She, in her place, refused him any help. With the least stiffening of her neck in silence. She let him look, sure that he wouldn't see, blind creature. Here in this line, Frost brings us into the mind of the wife. She's going to let him look. She's going to let him gaze out the window as she has. Confident in her superiority that he won't be able to see what she sees. For he is a, quote, blind creature. These two words sum up the way the wife perceives her husband. He is blind, he is unfeeling, he is more creature, more beast than man. She is the sensitive one. She is the one who grieves properly, who grieves fully. And a while he didn't see, but at last he murmured, oh, and again, oh, what is it? What, she said. So she's challenging him here. What is it you see? And he says, just that I see. You don't, she challenged. Tell me what it is. And now the man speaks. And the first two-thirds of the poem are mostly full of the man's words. There is a distinct shift about two-thirds of the way in where the woman speaks. But first we have the man. The wonder is I didn't see it once. There's a kind of casualness in that tone. I never noticed it from here before. I must be wanted to it. It's kind of an old-fashioned word, wanted. Uh, but it works much better than I must be used to it. It gives us a sense of his diction and his old fashionedness and his casualness. That's the reason, he says. The little graveyard where my people are. So he sees it now. He sees what she's been looking at, out that window, at the top of the staircase. And notice how he uses the word little, the diminutive, which kind of makes us able to look at the graveyard. It makes it softer and gentler. After all, it's a graveyard, but by saying the little graveyard, we're able to to look with the man and see it. So small the window frames the whole of it, he goes on. Not so much larger than a bedroom, is it? Which is kind of an odd comparison to the bedroom, to the room where husband and wife would have conceived the little boy who is now passed. There are three stones of slate and one of marble, broad-shouldered little slabs there in the sunlight on the side hill. So again, the little, the little slabs. We haven't to mind those. He's saying we don't have to pay attention to those other slabs of slate and stone. We don't have to grieve the other members of my family buried in the backyard. And he goes on, but I understand it is not the stones, but the child's mound. And here we have the crux. It's the new mound in which the boy is buried that the woman has been uh, transfixed by 
these many, we don't really know, these many days, weeks, months. We, we don't know how long they've been grieving. And in fact, the mystery, we don't know anything about their backstory. How long ago the boy died, what kind of marriage these two were in before, was it healthy, was it unhealthy. And that mystery gives the poem a kind of weight and actually lends this single scene a uh, greater gravity and import. Don't, 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 she cried. She doesn't want to go there, as we would say. And the repetition, and in a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, observation by Randall Gerald, who wrote a famous essay on this poem, he, he mentions how if you try out three don'ts, don't, 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 she cried, or five, don't, 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 uh, neither work. And he cites the four don'ts uh, as uh, a, a mark of the poem's uh, perfection. So the repetition here and the shutting down of the conversation uh, gives us the rhythm of argument, the rhythm of disagreement. And then we have action. The poem continues, She withdrew, shrinking from beneath his arm that rested on the banister, and slid downstairs and turned on him with such a daunting look. Again, Gerald... Randall Gerald, the, the critic, calls the, the use of the word slid, she slides down the banister, a bit of what he says is vivid indecorousness. So here, in the midst of a very serious poem, we have this absurd image of her sliding down the banister to sort of escape his grasp, to slide under his arm. And in fact, the poem uh, uh, arrives at a kind of early climax here. Because of their physical proximity, he has approached her on the stairs, and now she's going to slide down, and they're going to switch places. Now he is at the top of the stairs, and she'll be down beneath, uh, uh, near the door to the outside. So if ever there were a moment when maybe husband and wife could have connected, could have communicated, could have consoled each other, could have held one another, and spoken to one another from the heart, that moment is lost here. He said twice over before he knew himself, Can't a man speak of his own child he's lost? So there's repetition uh, that we don't even see written, but he, he says this twice in a, a, you know, an exasperated tone. And it's interesting the way Frost writes the line, Can't a man speak of his own child he's lost? The rhetorical nature of the question almost, almost gives the reader a moment to ask, Can it happen? Can one speak of such unspeakable things? And at the same time, the man is pleading, uh, begging his right, Can't I speak of this great loss? And of course she says, not you! And then breaks off abruptly with, oh, where's my hat? An odd moment of her attuning to a kind of public perception. She, she's going to go out. She needs her hat, right? Uh, it, it's, it's one of two moments where the outside world encroaches upon this very private, intensely private scene. She thinks, where's my hat? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a gentle woman. I need to wear my hat in public. And th but then she quickly uh, reverts. Oh, I don't need it. I must get out of here. I must get air. And then she sort of responds to his question saying, I don't know rightly whether any man can speak right, of his own child lost. He shouts her name, which is interesting. We, we're, we're, given, we're given her name, the wife's name, Amy. Don't go to someone else this time. And that says a lot, right? That tells us that she's run from him before. 
So we're, we're getting hints at the backstory that she has sought another for consolation before and that she'll do it again. He says, pleading, listen to me. I won't come down the stairs. Again, the implied aggression of that line I won't come down the stairs essentially says, I won't hurt you, right? I won't come near you. I won't touch you. You're safe here. But the fact that he has to say it, again, implies an underlying history uh, of tension, uh, perhaps of violence between these two. He sat and fixed his chin between his fists. Hear the eyes in that line. Fixed his chin between his fists. Uh, they give us a sense of his settledness, his defeatedness in this moment. And, and he tries to reach out here. There's something I should like to ask you, dear. Again, the dear softening, uh, the underlying uh, aggression of, of the man's approach. And she says, you don't know how to ask it. And this, of course, is a prevalent theme in the poem, the limits of language, uh, the failure of, of communication. But he's trying here. He says, help me then. And, and, and that line, help me, really seems to beg for sympathy from the reader for the husband. And what's her response? Her response to his pleading for help is a physical gesture, a threatening gesture. She's going to leave. The line is, her fingers moved the latch for all reply. So the latch here now is a symbol of the end of their marriage. If she undoes that latch and opens the door and crosses through that threshold, the marriage is over. So he speaks. Again, we're still we're in the second third of the poem now, and he is expressing himself and his frustrations in the relationship. My words are nearly always an offense. Again, the always indicating past trouble. Uh, as if everything he says offends her. And that at once he's frustrated with himself, he can't seem to say the right thing, but also he's frustrated with her, uh, and her overly sensitive nature, as the next line sh shows. I don't know how to speak of anything so as to please you. But I might be taught, I should suppose. I can't say I see how. Again, a soft moment for him. He could be taught, perhaps, not that he knows how. A man must partly give up being a man with women folk. <laughs> kind of a broad uh, generalization here. Um... Interesting how he says with women folk, you know, he really does generalize the thought, not just with you, but with all women, a man must basically give up part of his manliness in order to cohabitate, to abide with uh, women folk. We could have some arrangement by which I'd bind myself to keep hands off anything special you're mine to name. Though I don't like such things twixt those that love. And then he has these these curious two lines where the 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 meter is clunky, and he's trying to articulate some sort of wisdom, but uh, you know the the feet don't quite uh, read, uh, don't scan well, and you get a kind of clunky bit of wisdom. Two that don't love can't live together without them but two that do can't live together with them. Them being these kinds of rules, these, these kinds of arrangements between husband and life, wife. And what's her response? She moved the latch a little. He says, don't, don't go. Don't carry it to someone else this time. Tell me about it if it's something human. Let me into your grief. I think that's a beautiful line. And I think for the husband, this is his redeeming moment. He wants to hear of her grief. But as we'll see, he doesn't offer the degree of openness that he seems to be offering here later on in the poem. 
But certainly here, um, my own sympathy for the husband kind of reaches its its apex. And I hear him pleading with his wife for her to open and share her inner turmoil with him. He goes on, I'm not so much unlike other folks as you're standing there apart would make me out. So again, their physical distance is, is emphasized. He says, give me my chance. So in a brilliant switch, a brilliant reversal, Frost now has the husband, frankly, say too much. Um, and listen to these next few lines. I do think, though, you overdo it a little. That is a rather devastating line. The The husband here, after, as I've mentioned, uh, kind of showing his softer, tender side here, frankly, judges his wife and the way in which she is grieving. Uh, you know, Frost is famous for capturing the colloquial language of of New Englanders uh, at the time, uh, particularly rural folk. And this line is so down to earth. I do think, though, you overdo it a little. It's very much um, a plain line of spoken English. But it is devastating at the same time that he belittles her grieving, that he claims that it's some sort of petty social offense to overgrieve. And again, we have these characters coming into clear focus. The wife is overly sensitive, emotional, bottled up. The husband is categorical, willful, aggressive, and maybe unfeeling. And then he digs his own grave a little deeper, saying, What was it brought you up to think it the thing to take your mother loss of a first child so inconsolably in the face of love? You'd think his memory might be satisfied. I'm actually going to read from Randall Gerald's essay briefly because I think he sums up just how awful these lines from the husband are. He's, he, Gerald writes that the husband manages to crowd four or five kinds of condemnation into a single sentence. What was it brought you up? Says that it is not your essential being, but your accidental upbringing that has made you do this. It reduces the woman to a helpless social effect. Quote, to think it the thing is particularly insulting because it makes her grief a matter of fashion. It is as though he were saying, what was it brought you up to think it the thing to wear your skirt that far above your knees? The phrase, to take your mother loss of a first child, pigeonholes her loss, makes it a regular predictable category that demands a regular predictable amount of grief and no more. The phrase, so inconsolably in the face of love, condemns her for being so unreasonable as not to be consoled by, for paying no attention to that unarguably good, absolutely general thing, love. The generalized love makes demands upon her that are inescapable, compared to those which would be made by a more specific phrase like, in the face of my love for you. The man's you'd think his memory might be satisfied again condemns her for exceeding the reasonable social norm of grief, condemns her jealously for mourning as if the dead child's demands for grief were insatiable. The husband here uh, says the wrong thing, and we see uh, very vividly how they fail to communicate in, in their marriage. She responds, there you go sneering now. So, so again, it, it, it indicates a pattern that he attacks her for being overly sensitive, uh, that he pigeonholes, that he categorizes things in his own mind frequently, and that this is the way things often play out between the two of them. He responds, I'm not, I'm not, in denial, 
You make me angry. I'll come down to you. You hear him threatening now. God, what a woman. And it's come to this. A man can't speak of his own child that's dead. So he defends himself again that he's not allowed to speak. Uh, but in this instance, to me at least, he seems to be the blind creature his wife accused him of being for failing to see how destructive the things he's just said to her are. She says, you can't because you don't know how to speak. If you had any feelings, and so here again, she accuses him of being the one in the wrong. And so the poem, instead of giving us a portrait of husband and wife consoling one another, which would be an entirely different poem, we see a kind of downward spiral of desperation and frustration and communication failures. She blames him now for being unfeeling, for essentially not grieving enough. And she goes on, and this is the final third of the poem, and we hear the wife speak. We do get let into her grief, and it turns out to be not so much grief as disgust for her husband. She says, if you had any feelings, you that dug with your own hand, how could you, his little grave? Again, the stress of those syllables, your own hand, how could you? They're very damning. They're very one, two, three. I saw you from that window there, making the gravel leap and leap in air, leap up like that, like that, and land so lightly, and roll back down the mound beside the hole. The language there, very evocative of her watching him bury the child. She says, I thought, who is that man? I didn't know you. It could be argued that this line is the climax of the poem, is the kind of encapsulation of the utter alienation between these two. She watches her husband dig a grave for their child out the window and frankly searches herself for knowledge of, of him and, and finds none. She says, I didn't know you. And I crept down the stairs and up the stairs to look again. So there's this obsessiveness. She frankly is somewhat hysterical. And you can kind of hear the hysteria in the, in the rhythm of the line just before. Leap up like that, like that, and land so lightly. And now she's creeping up and down the stairs. So she's sort of fulfilling our image of her as the hysterical wife. And still your spade kept lifting. Then you came in. I heard your rumbling voice out in the kitchen. I don't know why, but I went near to see with my own eyes. It's as if she has to see this to believe it. She says, you could sit there with the stains on your shoes of the fresh earth from your own baby's grave and talk about your everyday concerns. See, it disgusts her. The S is there, very damn. You could sit there with the stains on your shoes that he could do something so matter-of-factly as dig a grave in lieu of the kind of grieving that she's doing, that she feels responsible to do, that she feels is her mother's duty, gives rise to uh, contempt for him in her heart. You had stood the spade up against the wall outside there in the entry, for I saw it. That moment is almost too perfect to, to imagine. That he stood the spade up disgusts her. That he didn't even have the, the grief enough to throw it to the ground. But that he, very workmanlike, stood it up against the wall. Which for him was probably, again cathartic to dig the grave, it was purging of his grief, that he could engage himself in something ordinary and every day, that he could in fact stand the spade up against the wall, put it in its proper place, giving his world a modicum of order, was probably natural for the man. And so we see almost at this point the characters coming into clear focus and behaving naturally as their characters and personalities uh, dictate, but the tragedy is that each is 
utterly isolated in their own world. And each angers and, and infuriates and frustrates the other. He says, I shall laugh the worst laugh I ever laughed. I'm cursed. God, if I don't believe I'm cursed. But she goes on with, with you know, opening herself up to him, trying to show him her grief, or as I said before, her disgust for him. She is going to explain herself, as he asked. I can repeat the very words you were saying, she says, and she quotes him. Three foggy mornings and one rainy day will rot the best birch fence a man can build. The nearly uh, uh, ridiculous lilt of, of the meter in these lines, three foggy mornings and one rainy day will rot the best birch fence a man can build. It's a tidy little aphorism that the man holds on to. Again, we see the man as categorizing, as able to live in his mind, able to compartmentalize his grief, and able to hold on to this little wise saying as his own form of consolation. But she finds it utterly repulsive. She goes on, think of it, talk like that at such a time. What had how long it takes a birch to rot to do with what was in the darkened parlor? A euphemism there in the darkened parlor for their dead son. You couldn't care. So again, the accusation of his essential hard-heartedness. And then, at the end of this stanza, the, the woman kind of incriminates herself. It's as if in both moments, at least the way I read it, we, we achieve a kind of apex of sympathy for one or other of, of uh, the characters here. In this case, the wife. At this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm with the wife. Um, <laughs> the man seems to a degree unfeeling and, and, and uh, uncommunicative um, in his own stumbling way. And she's making a good point. But then she goes on and kind of shows how she needs him to be the unfeeling one. So that she can be the superior griever. So that she can be the one who, amidst a world of utter callousness, she grieves. She alone feels. So let's see how she does that. The nearest friends can go with anyone to death. Come so far short, they might as well not try to go at all. Pessimistic thought there. And then probably the two darkest lines of the poem come from the, the mouth of the, the wife. No, from the time when one is sick to death, one is alone, and he dies more alone. Friends make pretense of following to the grave, but before one is in it, their minds are turned and making the best of their way back to life and living people and things they understand. Again, a recapitulation of the indictment against the husband. That's what he's done. He's turned his mind back to living things, which, again, he feels, uh, I imagine, is the right thing to do, but she condemns him. And this line, but the world's evil, again, showing us her kind of essential martyrdom, the world is wrong. I alone know how to feel. She says, I won't have grief, so if I can change it, oh, I won't, I won't. She's claiming her grief is natural, is her due, her duty. Now, the man replies, There, you have said it all and you feel better. Which is condescending. He feels he has done his job, he has listened, she has expressed herself, she has gotten it out of her system, so to speak, and he declares in his affirmative declaratory way, there, it's all better, all done. He says, you won't go now, you're crying, close the door, the heart's gone out of it, why keep it up? 
And so by this point, we know how these two operate, and we see the hopelessness of their relationship and of their attempts to communicate. Because probably at this moment, the husband feels like maybe they've had a breakthrough. But of course, the wife is far from feeling <laughs> anything of the sort. And to hear him sort of minimalize her grief by saying, there you go, there you got it out, it's all over, probably infuriates her to the utmost. And then a strange moment. He says, Amy, there's someone coming down the road. And we see the second moment the outside world intrudes upon this private scene as the husband is horrified to think that somebody will see them in the midst of this argument with the tears and the shouting and the hollering. And to think that his fear of a kind of public uh, embarrassment supersedes his concern and attention uh, to his wife uh, is kind of his uh, final condemnation. She says, you. And I should have italicized it here on the big board because it's italicized in the poem. You, oh, you think the talk is all. I must go. You see, for her, it's not something to be talked out. It's something to be felt. And for him... The grief is something to be talked out and compartmentalized and filed away. She says, I must go somewhere out of this house. How can I make you? The how can I make you is cut off and Frost shows us that there is no more understanding between these two by cutting that line off. He responds violently, if you do. She was opening the door wider. So again, her gesture, her movement, her body expresses her truth. She's going to leave. He tries one last desperate attempt with his language. Where do you mean to go? First, tell me that. He's like, tell me that at least. And he... And he again asserts himself in his aggressive way, I'll follow and bring you back by force. I will. And there the poem ends. So as we look here at a photograph of Robert Frost, the great American poet, perhaps the American poet, I want to leave you with just a sense of how to dig into a poem. Today we've done a close reading, and in doing a close reading, you want to take your time. You want to go through each line and see what you can unpack. Here we've unpacked essentially a poem about the failures of language about uh, a married couple's inability to communicate and console one another. And you might even say about sort of gender roles in terms of how we go about purging emotion. All of which will be, uh, would be uh, interesting to investigate, perhaps in uh, an essay on on the poem but I'll leave that part to you I as always thank you for joining me and I will see you in the future